In this video, we're examining another native group that lived here during the time of the fur trade, and that is the Potawatomi. The Potawatomi have had influence in this area for hundreds of years. This image here is of what the Potawatomi believed they looked like prior to the Europeans entering this area and engaging in the fur trade and changing the way they dress. So today we're going to explore how the Potawatomi got here, why there are such good farmers. We're going, to we're going to discuss a major figure in Potawatomi history that is tied to the history of Elkhart County and how the Potawatomi have continued to have an influence in this area even today. The origins of the Potawatomi come from a much larger group known as the Anishinaabe. The Anishinaabe lived for generations along the Atlantic coast. Then through a series of prophecies and visions, the Anishinaabe decided to head west. They headed west along what is today the St. Lawrence River. And during that journey, what happened was the Anishinaabe broke into three separate societies, groups that we know today as the Ojibwa, the Odawa, and the Potawatomi. So they finally settled around somewhere around Lake Huron. The Potawatomi would cross Lake Huron to the south and then finally move their way through what is today south southwest Michigan and north northwest Indiana and they would start to live in that area while the Ojibwa and the Odawa also occupied what is the rest of Michigan and then parts of Canada north of Lake Huron. Now, even though they were separate societies, these three groups still worked closely together in what was known as the Three Fires Alliance, and each had a specific role to fill. The Ojibwa were known as the keepers of the tradition, so they provided any spiritual guidance. The Odawa were the keepers of the trade, so they made sure the trading network that the native people were using remained fair and also remained open for free and fair trade at any moment. The Potawatomi had a very important role. They were known as keepers of the fire. So their job was to keep up all the spiritual and cultural customs among the three groups and make sure the traditions get passed down through generation, through generation, through generation. That role, the, the Three Fires Alliance is still held today. These three groups still work closely together, still sharing that common ancestry and heritage. During this period, the Potawatomi were really known as prolific farmers. They grew a number of different crops. Their two major crops that they were growing were corn, as well as harvesting wild rice along the shores of what is today Lake Michigan. But they were also scientists when they came to doing whatever they could to produce efficiency and produce more, and produce more crops year after year. That is evidenced by the technique the Potawatomi used known as companion planting. So companion planting is using a variety of different crops as they all work together to help them use less space and also create more production in your fields. So with the Potawatomi, the companion planting they were using was a mixture of corn, beans, and squash. So how this would all work is the corn would grow and as it would grow, the stalk would grow high. And then the beans would be planted around the corn stalk, especially as beans pole beans start to grow, they're going to grow and they're going to wrap around that corn stalk, providing the poles that the beans need to, need to grow properly. And then on the outside of that, they would plant squash kind of in a circle around the corn stalk and the beans because the, the squash provide uh, safety from vermin like animals or raccoons. They also provide shade. The corn stalks will help the, uh, help the squash grow because they'll provide the shade that the that the squash needs to grow. So all three of these crops were all working together. Today, the Potawatomi and lots of other people call this, this combination is known as the three sisters. But it was a way that the Potawatomi were innovating the way that they grew their crops to make sure that they were using less space, they were creating more efficient crops, they were creating more production that they would use not just to feed themselves, but also trade for items that they needed with the native groups. And then later, as Europeans entered this area and explore this region, they would use all these crops to help uh, trade for European goods as well. So as the Potawatomi occupied this area, their population started to grow and get bigger. 
and more and more villages were set up all across southern Michigan and northern Indiana. In Elkhart County, there was a village along the Elkhart River, which is, the village was located somewhere today where it would be south of Goshen, near what is today New Paris. Uh, we're not exactly sure of the exact location of the village, but we do know who was the leader for some time. And that was a Potawatomi leader named Onaksa, uh, otherwise known as, and more popularly known as in histories, as Wanangashonia or Wanangasea, or also known more, more popularly by his nickname, Five Metals. So Five Metals arrives in the historical record at the Treaty of Greenville in 1795. Uh, five Metals is seen as someone who could be is negotiating the deal with the native leaders in the American military to reach a compromise with the two groups. After the treaty is signed and negotiated, uh, Five Metals is seen as someone on the native side who can work with uh, in the eyes of the American military that could be worked with to reach deals as America starts to get bigger and bigger. Winona Shonya, Five Medals, and a number of other Native leaders traveled to Philadelphia to meet with the President of the United States, George Washington, in 1796 to discuss this very topic. Now, that wouldn't be the only President Five Medals would meet with. In 1801, he meets with President Thomas Jefferson to discuss all these different things. Most prominently, how could the Native groups figure out a way to continue to live on land that they lived on for generations as Americans get, America gets bigger and the population pushes farther west into more and more territory. Five Medals believes in the philosophy he's carrying after talking with all these leaders and presidents is that his group should adopt the American form of agriculture. So Five Medals and other Potawatomi were practicing agriculture for generations. But Five Miles believed that if they converted and started to practice the, and do the same techniques and use the same tools that American farmers were using, they would look in the eyes of Americans like Americans and they would have a common bond and that might allow them to stay on their, stay on their land as Americans moved west. However, that idea proved fruitless. Uh, Wananashonia would try to convince his people to adopt this American form of agriculture, which they didn't. Some deals were struck with groups that would hopefully come to uh, Five Metals Village and teach his people how to practice American agriculture. Those deals never materialized, so the people never were able to adopt that American form of agriculture. Then in 1812 and 1813, during the War of 1812, uh, the native groups in this area sided with the British against the United States. And in 1812 and 1813, American troops marched into what becomes Elkhart County and found Five Metals Village and burns, it, burns, them on two, burns the village completely down to the ground on two separate occasions. At that point, Wananashonia and its people we don't, we don't know where they escaped to. We don't know if they go up north to join other groups of Potawatomi or go further west. But the last time we see five medals on the historical record was the year 1818, where he's part of the Treaty of St. Mary's. And after that, five medals is no longer on the historical record, and we don't know what happened to him and how his history ended. So as time had stretched on into the early and mid 1800s, we see a period where native people were forcibly removed from this area uh, so they can make, so they can be removed. So Americans can move here and set up villages and places like Elkhart County and the cities of like Elkhart, Goshen, South Bend, and a number of different areas that we know as Michiana today. Now, while some, most native people were forcibly removed, there were groups that were able to stay. And for the Potawatomi, that was important because they continue to thrive in this area even to today. And the person who was the, the leader to getting the Potawatomi to stay even after a number of them were removed is this man right here. His name is Leopold Polkagan. He was a leader of a group that lived along southern uh, Lake Michigan. Now, through a series of treaties and agreements and even sometimes court cases, Leopold Pokagan was, evil, was able to advocate for the people living on 
what was ancestral Potawatomi land for generations. He was able to negotiate and advocate and finally reach an agreement that allowed them to stay there. While other native groups around here were forcibly removed further west to places like Oklahoma and Kansas. Now, Leopold Pokagan is the leader of what is today, was the leader of what is known today as the Pokagan Band of Potawatomi that still live in Southern Michigan today. They have their own government forms, they have their own health care, they have their own businesses, and they continue to talk about their history and teach people their history and teach people their language and their culture that has never left this area for hundreds of years. So due to Pokagan and the histories, historians and the people keeping the culture today, the Potawatomi continue to have an impact here in this region.